The reading this morning is Mark chapter 16, verses 1 to 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone, because they were afraid. Good morning, everyone. He is risen. I think that's my favourite part of Easter Sunday. <laughs> that happening. Can I say welcome? It's terrific to be together uh, this Resurrection Sunday. Uh, and especially welcome if you're visiting among us. There's a whole stack of people who are here uh, for the first time celebrating with us today. It's a real joy to have you here gathered with us this Easter Sunday. Uh, my name's John. I'm one of the pastors here uh, at Capera Baptist. And uh, yeah, we'd love a chance to get to know you. Uh, today we do have morning tea on after the service uh, in the hall, that's the, the building just adjacent um, and so we'd love if you can to stick around and give us a chance, give us an opportunity to get to know you. Uh, let me just pray briefly as we come to God's Word. Uh, God, what a thrill it is to gather on Resurrection Sunday, uh, the day that we remember that you in power raised your son from the dead. Lord, what a rich joy to celebrate that together and we pray that as we come uh, to your word now that you would speak to our hearts, you would encourage us, uh, you would elevate our hearts and give us rich joy as we celebrate this incredible good news of Jesus' resurrection. Amen. <laughs> uh, well, I reckon it might have been about Tuesday the 27th of June, 1995. I think it was then, if not exactly then, thereabouts, plus or minus a week or so. It started like any other Tuesday. It was the mid-year school holiday. I was in year nine, so I'm almost 14. And it's my first time helping out at our church's vacation Bible school, or VBS, as that was affectionately known back then. But see, this was no ordinary day. I think it was that day or thereabouts that I met Meg. <laughs> I certainly remember meeting her mum because she was the director of VBS. Uh, Meg would have been in grade two. <laughs> a picture of a cute little orange haired girl, freckles. Wasn't love at first sight. <laughs> now I don't remember much about that day. Uh, Meg doesn't remember much at all about me for about ten and a half years after that. <laughs> but it was a big day. It was an extraordinary day in my life, though I didn't realise it at the time. And life's full, isn't it, of those kind of seemingly ordinary moments that turn out to be extraordinary, that in hindsight we can look back on and see just how extraordinary they were. Often it's the day that we met someone who became significant in our life in one way or another. The day you got a job, the day children or grandchildren were born, the, the day you bought a, a home that became your family's home for decades, the day that you set out on a particular holiday that was memorable for your family for years and years. Many of those days we don't particularly remember, but they happened nonetheless and were significant. And so as we gather together this Resurrection Sunday, we're kind of asking, is today just another ordinary day? Is today just another ordinary Sunday? 
You know, as I drove here this morning, I saw people exercising and walking the dog, just like I would any other Sunday or any other weekend. But I know there are games of footy on the TV later today, just like any other Sunday. And many people are off on holidays, at the beach, camping somewhere, just like any other long weekend. But for many of you, coming here to church on a Sunday is just like any other Sunday. The world wants us to believe that today is just another ordinary day. But is today just another ordinary day? Was the Sunday after Jesus' crucifixion just another ordinary day? Uh, well, if you've been with us uh, this term, you'll know that we've been working through Mark's Gospel in our series, The Kingdom Comes. Uh, we started in late January and, and today on Resurrection Sunday is our final, uh, our final sermon. Uh, if you're interested, uh, you can ask me later as to why I'm stopping at verse 8 of the chapter, but that's as far as we go. <laughs> as we go back to that Sunday, though, roughly 2,000 years ago, it all seemed pretty ordinary, at least to begin with. The women who come to the tomb are the same ones who'd been with Jesus in Galilee, who were nearby to the cross as he died, who saw Jesus' body laid in the tomb on Friday afternoon. <coughs> Can anyone kill that fan for me? I'll survive. Yeah, they, are, they are devoted. They loved Jesus as friend and saviour. They didn't leave him during his suffering. Now they come with spices for the embalming of his body. At verse 1 there says, When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so they might go and anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they, they were on their way to the tomb. And they asked each other, who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? So these women, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome, not mentioned in Mark's Gospel until Jesus' crucifixion, now they kind of surface as prime witnesses to the events that are the foundation of Christian belief. That Jesus died, was buried, and was raised again. They come early on Sunday morning expecting to apply the spices that they had bought to a dead, brutalised corpse. They are drawn to the tomb by their loyalty to Jesus, determined to kind of render their last service to their master. But they suspect nothing unusual. Given the circumstances, there's nothing terribly surprising going on at first. Their, their good friend, their master, has died on Friday. And so we expect these women to uh, purchase spices and anoint the body. That would be the right thing for them to do. It's right that they would wait until sunset on Saturday to go to the shop to make the purchase because Saturday was the Sabbath, so all of that would have been shut. It's to be expected that they would make to their, their way to the tomb at the very earliest opportunity. And so that's the first thing on Sunday morning uh, around dawn. And of course, as they make their way there, they're having a very normal conversation, wondering about who's going to move the large tombstone for them. It's clear, even Jesus' closest disciples, even these women, were not expecting the resurrection. They aren't going to the tomb expecting to find something miraculous. They're going expecting to find what would be ordinary. But from this point on, things are no longer ordinary. Things start happening that are unexpected. Uh, look again from verse 4. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. The large stone has been rolled away. And now there's a young man dressed in a white robe in the tomb. Now, although Mark doesn't specifically say that this young man is an angel, that's what we're to understand. The other gospel writers make that plain to us. Mark's not deliberately disguising something, but anyone in shining white clothes that looked like that was understood to be a young man, a heavenly, uh, sorry, was understood to be a heavenly being, an angel. And the women are alarmed. Now, pretty much everyone in the Bible who encounters 
an angelic being like that, is alarmed as well. This is no ordinary Sunday. Instead of finding Jesus' dead body in the tomb, they meet an angel sitting there. And then the angel speaks to the women. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Don't be alarmed. Stay calm, the angel says. What? How? The dead body's not there. There's an angel talking to us. <coughs> There's nothing ordinary going on anymore. This is extraordinary. And his words are important too. As the angel reports what has happened, he paints a picture with two clear contrasts. He says, you are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He was crucified, but he has risen. You are looking for a body here, but he is not here. He knows who they are looking for. Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus the one they have been following for a few years now. Jesus whose ministry began back in Nazareth in Galilee. As he taught and preached and helped and healed people. Jesus who grew up in Nazareth and learned his father's trade as a carpenter. But not only that, it is Jesus who was crucified. This is the Jesus they are looking for. Jesus who was crucified on Friday, just gone. Well, he was crucified. He was buried here. He has been dead. But the angel says he is not here. He has risen. But the angel couldn't make it any more plain. <laughs> Jesus, whose body they have come to anoint, is not there. Because he's, mirac he's miraculous, miraculously and completely risen from the dead. The one who was crucified is now risen. The whole situation has been flipped upside down in that moment. In the second half of Mark's Gospel, Jesus has spoken repeatedly about what would happen to him when he went to Jerusalem. That he would suffer at the hands of the Jewish religious leaders, be handed over to the Romans, be beaten, scourged, and then die. But that was never all that he said. Each time he signalled his approaching death, it was accompanied by the promise of his resurrection. That he would die and rise again was always to be the punchline. From the very first verse, Mark's Gospel has always been about Jesus as Messiah and Son of God. His suffering, death and resurrection was always at the very core of his messianic mission. Mark's mission, uh, sorry, Mark's message now has reached its climax. Jesus' life and ministry has reached its climax. The Saviour, the King, has come and He has completed His mission to rescue and redeem a people for God, to free them from the power of sin and death. And He has achieved it by dying and rising again. The second contrast then comes in the last part of verse 6. The angel says, He is not here. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. The evidence they needed as the kind of basis of their faith was there before them in, in Jesus' life and death and resurrection. But entering into it would require them to act on their faith. Only days earlier in Mark 14, Jesus had promised them that after his resurrection, they would find him in Galilee. He would go ahead of them, kind of lead them as it were, to Galilee. And now they must follow him there. They must travel back home to Galilee in order to discover that he was there. This wasn't the end of the journey, but the beginning of a new one. A lifelong journey of faith that would be a daily exercise of following Jesus. 
an experience of trust in Him who lived and died and rose again for them to follow Him forever. This is the faith and discipleship to which the gospel draws them and us from the outset. But Mark's account finishes in verse 8 on a disappointing and slightly puzzling note. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. They're trembling and bewildered. Other translations say, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. They're full of both joy and and awe, but it leaves them paralysed with fear. See, we can't, we might expect Mark, we want Mark to tell us that the women triumphantly brought the good news back to the disciples and, and they all went off together to find him in Galilee. But in Mark's account, we finish with them running away in fear. Finally, Jesus' followers are told to speak publicly. Think of all the times Jesus has healed someone, cast out a demon, done the miraculous and says, and, shh, don't tell anyone yet. Finally, he says, go and tell, speak. And they don't. They're silent. It's clear enough from history that at some point the disciples, including Peter, were told of his resurrection. Other Gospels tell of their reunion with the resurrected Christ in Galilee. And they go on in the book of Acts, of course, to preach of Christ's resurrection to the multitudes. It did happen, but as Mark finishes, he kind of leaves us hanging. Yes, it's possible that Mark wrote a longer ending to his gospel that's been lost, but that's, the scholars think that's unlikely. The weakness of those who follow Jesus has been a constant issue. We've got Peter's denial, Judas's betrayal, their unbelief and their misunderstanding all the time, and Mark kind of leaves us in that space with that unresolved. In Mark's account, we're left not focused on Jesus' followers or his interactions or their interactions with Jesus after the resurrection. We're simply left with the stark reality of the resurrection itself. Mark is content to say, and he rose from the dead. The end. Three things I want you to take away. Three things about the resurrection that I want you to take away. The first is, is that the story is credible. It's believable. And Mark wants us to see that. Mark includes some specific details in the narrative, various timing markers about what happened before the Sabbath and after the Sabbath and and what time on Sunday morning. The names of the women. See, these kinds of things would have been verifiable in that first generation. People could have found Mary and Mary and Salome and said, were you there? Is that how it happened? And so they add to the credibility of the story. If Mark was making this up, hoping to persuade people that Jesus rose from the dead when he didn't really, then let me say he ought to have done a much better job than what he did. A major thing which we can miss in our culture, and happily, uh, in Mark's record, is that the witnesses to Jesus' resurrection are women. Now, in first century culture, a woman's testimony didn't count in a court of law. It didn't work the same way as a man's. These women are witnesses to the crucifixion, to the burial, to the empty tomb, and the angel's message about the resurrection. If you wanted to be persuasive in the first century, that's not who you would have had turn up. You would have had the head apostles turn up. A bunch of men. You Ideally, you would have had a Pharisee, a chief priest or someone that believed it turn up because they were credible witnesses the testimony of women wasn't always given credence in the first century context and here is Mark using the witness of these three women as the core to the essential facts of the gospel the gospel Jesus whole mission rises and falls on his death burial and resurrection and Mark says it was these three women who were there they saw it The response of those who found his empty tomb is incomplete and perfect. And the ending doesn't resolve everything neatly for us. We're left wondering about their meeting in Galilee. See, if Mark was massaging the facts to persuade people, 
you just wouldn't finish the gospel like that. You'd do a much better job. And none of these things would have been left how they were. And so these kind of awkwardnesses actually point to the legitimacy and the genuineness of Mark's story. They make it more, not less credible because he hasn't neaten it up the way that we would like him to. It's credible, it's believable, it also it's essential. We know that Jesus' death on the cross paid for sin. The once and for all sacrifice which made atonement for sin. Which created a way for us to be forgiven. But the resurrection is essential also. But the gospel is incomplete without Jesus rising from the dead. It is core to the content of the Apostles' proclamation of the Gospel, if you look through the book of Acts. And it's been proclaimed by Bible-believing Christians for 2,000 years since. As Peter, just for one example, preaches the Gospel to the Jewish leaders in Acts chapter 4, he puts the fact of the resurrection front and centre. He says, Then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead that this man stands before you healed. It is Jesus who God raised from the dead that is the one that Peter has trusted in and who has the power. This is a key pillar upon which our faith hinges. Paul says the gospel, the message of good news that saves you is about Jesus' resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verses 2 to 4, he says, by this gospel you are saved skipping ahead just a little bit, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. It's essential to the gospel. Peter says that the resurrection is essential to our hope of eternal life in 1 Peter 1 verse 3 and 4. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. The resurrection really is the thing upon which all of Christianity stands or falls. We can't dismiss it as irrelevant because, because we might find it difficult to believe or, or awkward to explain to others. Salvation is found only in Jesus. Our living and eternal hope is secure because of the resurrection of Jesus. Because of Jesus' death and resurrection, we can be saved. But the main thing that I want you to see is that this is truly extraordinary. The extraordinary has happened on that first Resurrection Sunday. During his earthly ministry, Jesus had raised other people from the dead. There's Jairus' daughter, a 12-year-old girl. There's Lazarus and others. But those people would all die again. There wasn't a permanent change to their being, merely kind of a resuscitation of their bodies. But Jesus' resurrection, it was different. It was unique. It was permanent. He never died again. It was a resurrection to a whole new state of being, into a body that was immortal. This was the resurrection of the God-man to an indestructible new life. Paul says this in a few different ways in his letters. In Colossians 1, he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so then everything he might have the supremacy. In 1 Corinthians 15, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Through since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all be made alive. Jesus is the firstborn from among the dead. That is, he is the firstborn of the resurrected ones. The one who was first to be raised to an immortal resurrected life. And he is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The beginning of the resurrection age. Like the first fruit in a harvest season, Jesus' resurrection is the sure sign that other resurrections will follow He's the founder and leader of a new humanity, of those who by faith have been rescued from sin, reconciled to God, and who will share in his eternal resurrection life. With Jesus' resurrection, a whole new era in salvation history has arrived. 
And so, that first Resurrection Sunday, it was no ordinary day. God has done the extraordinary by raising Jesus from the dead. That day was the day that truly changed everything. That day changed the world forever. So don't let today be just another ordinary day. I implore you, please don't go home today ignoring the significance of today. Ignoring the significance of Jesus' resurrection. In giving his son to die on the cross in our place for our sin and by raising him from death, God has made a way for us to be forgiven, to be saved from judgment, to receive eternal life. And so we just need to admit, believe and accept. Admit that we need help. Admit that at our core we have a problem that we simply do not have the resources to solve on our own. To believe in Jesus' death and resurrection. That they achieve forgiveness of sins and the secure hope of eternal life. And accept Jesus' offer of forgiveness that comes only by his grace as a free gift not earned by any one of us. Not because of anything we have done, but because his death for our sins and his powerful resurrection to new life has done it for us. But don't let today be just another ordinary day. And in fact, don't let any other day in your life be just an ordinary day. Not one single day. God has done the extraordinary in raising Jesus from the dead. He offers us an extraordinary hope of eternal life. He offers us life now of extraordinary purposefulness as we cooperate with his purposes in living as followers of Jesus. And he enables us to live with extraordinary joy because we know he has the power to overcome even sin and death. What God did that day has changed everything. So live every day that God gives you on this planet in light of that day. Live every day of your life in light of that extraordinary day that God raised Jesus from the dead. Live every day with hope, with purpose and with real joy. Live every day thinking acting, speaking, working, relating to people in ways that point to the incredible thing that God did for you on that great day. That he raised his son Jesus and our Lord Jesus from the dead. That truly was the greatest day in history. Let that day shape the rest of your life. Let that day change you. God our Father, we thank you for that day. That day that you raised your Son, our Lord Jesus, from the dead. Lord, we want to say that we, we believe it. We believe that it's credible. We believe Mark's account of what happened. Lord, we acknowledge that it is essential to our faith. Lord, I pray that if there are any here today who have not yet believed your resurrection until today, who perhaps have never admitted their sin and believed and accepted your forgiveness, I pray that today would be the day. And Lord, we pray that every other day of our lives would be lived in light of that day. With hope, with purpose, and with real joy. Because you raised Jesus from the dead.